Next on the Broadway show, she's wicked good. I'm talking to Broadway's reigning alphaba, Talia Suskauer. Plus, it's a collaboration of love. You'll hear the miraculous survival story of one of the stars of the collaboration, Eric Jensen. And it's a beautiful noise. I'm chatting with Tony nominee, Will Swenson, to talk about playing Neil Diamond on Broadway. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is the Broadway show. Each and every week, we are excited to bring you the Broadway show, and that's why I'm so glad you're here. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Popular, you're gonna be popular. I'll teach you the proper ploys when you talk to boys. Little ways to flirt with laughs. Wicked is iconic, the fifth longest running musical in Broadway history and still going strong. I got to know the reigning alphabet in Wicked, Talia Suskauer. Let's talk about you. You have wanted this role since what, as long as you can remember? Yeah, absolutely. I remember being in a musical theater after school class in elementary school and someone came in with the Wicked vocal selection songbook and I said, what is this? And went home and, and made my mom buy me the album, the CD. And ever since then was hooked and got to see it on Broadway in 2005 and I've wanted to play Alphaba ever since. What was it about Alphaba? Because I'm sure you saw a bunch of other Broadway shows after mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a strong, powerful woman, misunderstood, who is completely unique. And I mean, it's, this is a character that we have all grown up with. And the thing I love about Wicked and what it does for this character is shows a different perspective on her and how she came to be known as who she is, the Wicked Witch. And so I think I've just, I love her individuality and her strength and the killer song she gets to sing. And I love her journey. And so from a young age, really identified with it. Do you feel like it's a journey you're on as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, someone coming into themselves and making incredible friendships and meeting people along the way that change your life. I, I take the journey every night as Elphaba and as Talia, I get to, I get to as well. So I'm curious, I wanna just go back for a minute. You probably, you know, at a young age, a lot of kids said, that's what I wanna do, I wanna be this, I wanna be that. <laughs> but you must have had real support for saying that as, at a young age and then being able to, to move through you know, your dreams because it, it takes other people and it takes a real support system. Yeah, I'm nothing without my village of people. Um, my parents were insanely supportive of me and my sister and I are actually both in the arts so they really just shepherded us and supported us throughout that journey and I, I'm nothing without my teachers and my mentors. So my first voice teacher, Craig Wick um, in Florida, we were singing these songs together from such a young age and he was such a huge cheerleader for me and he actually got to see me do the part on Broadway. It's the greatest gift to be able to give back to your teachers. I've had a bunch of other professors and teachers come fly up from wherever to come see the show and it's amazing to be able to give back and say look what you helped me do. This is where Wicked was born at the Gershwin Theater so to be able to tell this story in the same theater I saw Wicked in when I was a young kid and it's so incredible to be able to be a part of this long legacy of women that have played this part. Well, I want to ask you about that because I think that, you know, there are a lot of young women all over the country that go, you know, they want to come into New York and, you know, get get an apartment and, and audition, audition, audition. What is your advice to them, thoughts for them? A couple things. I think that there are going to be a lot of people that try to um, dim your light for this art form and tell you that you're too much. You're never too much. You're just enough take what makes you different and run with it and fly with it. I mean, I have always been a tall and lanky, like, weirdo. And I think that no one really knew what to do with me when I was younger, especially in terms of casting and, and theater. I played all the mom roles, but that was really, I think, what set me apart. Um, the way that I look and the way that I present. I think everyone has a really unique perspective and that's why we could have a line of 24, 25 different women playing Alphaba and they're all gonna be different because they're all different people. You've got a few more weeks to see the collaboration on Broadway extended now through February 5th. Paul Bettany and Jeremy Pope play two of the giants in modern art history, but for another actor in the play, it's practically a miracle that he's on that stage. Let's send it out to Paul Wontorek. That's right, Tamsin. Last February, Eric Jensen complained of a headache and suddenly blacked out. We met up in his Brooklyn home to talk about how that terrifying moment led to his Broadway debut. 
you're having quite a moment right now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you could say that. Yeah, I mean, it's been quite a year, so I'm having quite a yeah. moment. Yeah. So can we just dig right into this? Yes, all my moments are moments now. I I'm thrilled that <laughs> you're with us. Yeah, right on. Because it's you, tell me about this day in February. Well, as you know, my wife Jessica Blank and I are, yeah. are playwrights as well and, and, and TV writers, and uh, we work together. And um, our play Coal Country was yeah. going up at the Cherry Lane Theater, and uh, they were teching. And I was here just hanging out by, my, by myself. Uh, my assistant was upstairs, and I all of a sudden said I, had a, I have a headache, and I had a seizure, and I passed out cold. And um, it turned out that I had a, a, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is a, a, a lot of people refer to it as a brain aneurysm, uh, a big one. And uh, the kind of aneurysm I had, 50% of the people who get it die outright. And of the 50% who survive, 80% uh, either have some cognitive or physical difficulties. And I had none of those after uh, getting my surgery from my amazing, wonderful doctors who saved my life. That's a lot to say. It was say. a lot to say, yeah. It was a lot to happen. And, and um, you know, our show was going up. Yeah. And then, you know, I was in recovery. And then uh, about four weeks had passed and I was feeling pretty good. And then one of our actors got COVID and Jessica said, you know, we don't have any understudies. You're the only one who knows the part. Do you want to? And I was like, oh, I don't know. And I got up and I ran the show and I ran the part for him for four performances. And then we finally got an understudy. In you know, I've heard a lot of amazing understudy swing stories during COVID, <laughs> but that, one, that, that one's pretty good. Like just recovering from the brain aneurysm. Sure, I'm out. Nothing but respect for wonder studies. That's, that's <laughs> wonder my, studies, uh, that's absolutely. My, uh, that's my mantra, yeah. But then what happened after that is um, we w took a vacation after our show had closed. And we went to London and I went to see my friend Indira Varma and she was in a play with Amelia Clark yeah. from Game of Thrones. And Amelia's had two of these. And wow. uh, she's had two aneurysms during Game of Thrones. And um, she was very quiet about it. And then um, she published an article about it, a very moving article about coming back from it. And I was so inspired uh, that I called my agents when I got back and I was like, listen, I really think we need to up our game here and, and let's like, go for some bigger stuff. And the next thing that came along was the collaboration, which is on Broadway right now, and I'm making my debut. In the collaboration, Jensen plays Bruno Weisskopfberger, the real-life art dealer who brought Basquiat and Warhol together for their divisive joint art show. It's interesting that the first show that I'm doing coming back from this is called The Collaboration because it's my favorite thing to do, first of all. Yeah. But collaboration requires a kind of love. And I love Paul Bettany, and I love Jeremy Pope, and I love Krista Rodriguez, and I love Kwame Kwearma, and I love yeah. Anthony, our writer. And I love being at the theater. And, and so I want to I wanna move anything that I do moving forward from this way out. It's, it's, it's got to have love in it. Or I don't, or, or it's not necessary for me to be me to be there if it doesn't have that. Somebody else can take the take I, the gig, you know. This is Brooklyn. You live in Brooklyn. This yeah, is where yeah. Where you make is, your art, so you you're able to have an office and a home, and that's like a luxury. A it's lot like of people. a mom and pop thing. We live literally live above the store, that's and so cool. um, we have our meetings here. Uh, we have production meetings here, and we've written most of our plays from here. So you commute to the city. I mean, I guess it's not that bad of a commute. I was biking to rehearsal until I got rained on, and then I was like, <laughs> okay, I've had it with this. It's time for me to be brave enough it's winter. to get the You're subway. You're doing Broadway again. in the winter yeah, time. Exactly. Yeah, get ready. Exactly. I want to talk to uh, Jessica. I want to go in there. And oh, talk let's. To her. let's Let's do it. Let's talk yeah. to my wife. She's she's much more interesting than me. I promise. <laughs> Alongside wife Jessica Blank, Judson has created a series of interview-based docu-plays that started in 2002 with The Exonerated, which told the story of innocent death row inmates. Since then, they've tackled topics like the U.S. invasion of Iraq, a West Virginia coal mine explosion, and COVID-19 frontline workers. When you visit their home in Brooklyn, the walls are filled with outlines of future projects. I believe that stories change us. They move us and in the ways that they move us, they can actually change our minds, change our thinking, change who we're able to empathize with. So we're choosy with what we write about. Like we think not only about what we're interested in, but what telling a story about that thing will do mm. in the world. Bringing public voice to people who may not collectively necessarily be heard um, to make it more than a newspaper story for people is kind of our mission. You two actually fell in love in the very beginning as artists. Like you started working together and you went on like a crazy road trip and that's sort of what led to. The crazy road trip we had in 2000 led to our collaboration. And um, 
Well, actually, I would say I would say I'm the in the relationship though. You're you're kind of the Warhol and I'm the Basquiat. Oh really? Would you, don't you think? I don't know. I think we go back and forth. You don't think so? Uh, I don't know, Andy. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, we really so. did meet as artists, and then we had the idea for our play, The Exonerated. A month after we met, we got engaged on the road, doing the interviews for that play. We got married within a year because collaborating, working together, really accelerates everything. It's like we we kind of looked at each other, and it was like there was no like drama about like are we going to get married or how committed are we to each other, or, like whatever. It was like oh, we've got work to do. Yeah. This is the Broadway show. We're back in just a few. Peace, I'm Common, and you're watching the Broadway show. Love. Welcome back to the Broadway show. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Let's get back to it. A Beautiful Noise, the Neil Diamond musical, is now open on Broadway. Will Swenson brings the story of an undeniable great to life every night. The musical featuring Neil Diamond's biggest hits, including Crackling Rosie and Sweet Caroline. Let's jump in and talk about it. So, Neil Diamond, it feels like it could be daunting, but you are handling it effortlessly, it seems. <laughs> yeah, uh, performing Neil Diamond as Neil Diamond in front of Neil Diamond is one of the more bizarre things I've ever done. Well, that's what I want to ask you. This has to be different from so many of the other shows, so many TV shows and, um, and on Broadway, but is it, how is this one different? I mean, I, I've never played somebody who was living before and somebody that, that people know so well, like people, everybody knows his songs and his mannerisms and his sound. So to not nail it, people are going to be like, that's wrong. I can check the YouTube and he doesn't move like that. He doesn't sound like that. So it's a little daunting. No pressure, right? Yeah, no pressure. Um, big fan of Neil Diamond? Huge. Yeah? Yeah, no, legit. My dad's favorite singer of all time. Oh, wow. Uh, just was on a loop in our house growing up. There was, uh, we had a, an autographed picture of Neil Diamond hanging in our garage. So it was just like in my bones before I even started. Wow, that's, yeah. but that's incredible, right? That's yeah. an incredible way to do it. So you already, you already knew at least the songs. <laughs> at sure. least a lot of the songs. For sure, yeah. You did perform with him though, right? Fenway Park? Oh my gosh, yeah. Can we talk about that? We because can talk I can't. About it. <laughs> even gives me chills and I wasn't even there. <laughs> it was nuts. I mean, Boston people love Neil Diamond and they sing Sweet Caroline at every single Red Sox game. And when Neil was in town, they asked him if he'd go and he was like, yeah, bring the cast. And so we showed up and we sang Sweet Caroline with Neil at Fenway. It was incredible. Touching me, touching So for you, uh, standing there with him and, uh, and performing that song, is there anything you've learned about him now that you're actually knowing the person, not just, you know, him as a... Yeah, just that it's in his bones. Just like the minute they, they pushed play on the on the track to, to start singing, he was just, he just like stepped in, which is like, where it began. He just, you just saw like all the years of him singing that song and understanding how to work a crowd. It was just kind of awesome to watch him step into that, that spotlight. I love seeing uh, so many of these shows now on, on Broadway um, with, about real people. Music changes us, obviously, we know yeah. that. It brings us back and it, it moves us forward. Do you think that that's why that has become so, so popular on Broadway? They're inspiring stories of success. Niels is, in particular, really inspiring. And he wrote so many joyous songs, and that's certainly in short supply these days. So mm -hmm. I think people are thrilled to come and, and have that nostalgia of, of all the joyous moments that those songs have been associated with them throughout their lives. and then. Our story is told in a really artful, moving way um, to, to kind of understand what Neil went through and, and, uh, and how he came out on top, and that's inspiring as well. It's all about the best and brightest of Broadway each and every week here on The Broadway Show. And that's why we're taking you inside The Players. It's a private social club, home to one of the largest collections of stage memorabilia on the planet. Let's send it out to Perry Sook. Thanks, Stamson. Today, just about any place in New York would be happy to welcome the stars of the stage and screen. But in 1888, that was not so much the case. Luckily for them, Shakespearean actor Edwin Booth founded The Players, 
a club right here on Gramercy Park South in his very own home. The club today is going strong and has members like, well, me. So I'm happy to take you as my guest as we go explore the players. Hey, how's it going, Michael? Good to see you. Wonderful, see you, wonderful. So we are here with Michael McCurdy, president of the players, uh, literally on the floor as much as anyone else. You, oh, you yeah. walk in, I, you're, you're a true member and I the president. I spend a lot of time here, yeah. Well, this is the Great Hall. Uh, this building was originally built in the 18, 1840s. In 1888, Edwin Booth, the probably the most famous American actor of his, of his, uh, of his time, uh, bought it in 1888 and asked Stanford White, his friend, to convert it into a clubhouse. Can you point out some of some of the things? You know, we have so like, this the is Coward actually piano. this piano belonged to Noel Coward. It was in Paris from 1939 to 1950 in his apartment in Paris. So much history, and to be surrounded by all the paintings, it, it really fits and uh, is a lovely addition to the club. So, yeah. can, can you show us uh, the sure, rest of the go, club? Let's, let's go. So we're here on the balcony mm -hmm. overlooking beautiful Gramercy Park. In the center of the park is a statue of our founder, Edwin Booth. And what we do is on uh, Booth's birthday, which is November 13th mm -hmm. every year, we have a small program here and then we have a candlelight vigil. We cross the street and go into the park and sing happy birthday to Mr. Booth. Now, Michael, I've been a member for almost two years now, and I still feel like every time I walk into the club, I, I see something new, uh, including right here, the drawers that open. Can you show me some of the artifacts sure, around here? Sure, sure. There's, there's artifacts throughout the building, um, and uh, many of these were props for Mr. Booth, but he also collected these life masks, and you've got some incredible uh, uh, characters here. You've got David Garrick, a famous British actor of the uh, 18th century, uh, Edmund Burke as well. And we have several others throughout the building, mm -hmm. so it's it's really a collection that's uh, unequaled anywhere else. One of the things you'll see throughout the whole clubhouse are quotes from Shakespeare. They're on most of the fireplace mantles and various other places throughout, because obviously um, Mr. Booth's forte was Shakespeare. Come to the club and learn things. You know, I've sat in these chairs having cocktails and, and never even noticed such such beautiful. Yeah. I've been a member here for club. 20 years, and I I can I still find new things to find out <laughs> here. So before we go into the library, I want to show you what we call the equity room. Let me read you what the plaque says on the equity room door. In this room, during the first three months of 1913, they're met without permission a small committee of four or five, which ultimately led to the formation of Actors' Equity Association. Wow. Oh man, what a beautiful room. I've come in here too many times, you know, stu study lines, work on material. It's just absolutely stunning. And what a, what a collection of books we well, have Well, Booth here. had a collection, a personal collection of over a thousand volumes. <laughs> and uh, it's been added to over the years by members and, and donations. Um, before they built the uh, Library of the Performing Arts at Lincoln Center, this was probably the largest collection of American theater in the country. Now we would be a little bit remiss to go all through Edwin Booth's house and not mention his little brother, John Wilkes Booth. Uh, there is something that I find as an American historian very, very interesting that belongs to the club. Can you tell me a little about it? So obviously Mr. Booth, Mr. Edwin Booth was, was devastated by what his brother had did uh, by assassinating Abraham Lincoln. And he felt that it was his duty to resign from the theater, uh, to retire. Uh, he thought no one would ever come to see him again after what his brother did. Uh, the public did not react that way to him. And within a, a, less than a year, he came back on the stage. But at the time of Lincoln's death, he did write a letter that was published in many papers, uh, a letter to the American theater. And we have it up in our archives upstairs, but we have a copy of it right here in the library. So now we're on the third floor of the clubhouse. The most famous room here in the building is his bedroom, his sitting room and bedroom. Nothing's been touched since he's died. The bedspread, the slippers by the bed, all were left just as they were when he passed away. I mean, you can feel it. It's almost like a time capsule. It's, uh, and even the smell, it is just... People talk about the smell right. all the time. He was a pipe smoker, and, and I think still after all this time, that smell still lingers in this room. Countless props. I mean, we have, we have a sword uh, from, I'm sure, some beautiful Shakespearean production. My favorite prop in maybe the entire building, the skull over here. In Hamlet, uh, Yorick is played by a skull that Hamlet holds. 
Um, Mr. Booth's father, Junius Brutus Booth, was also an actor. He was the immigrant that first came over uh, from England. And uh, the legend goes that there was a horse thief that was about to be hanged mm -hmm. who was a fan of Mr. Booth Sr. And he asked that his skull be given to Mr. Booth to be used in Hamlet. And that's the skull right there. For an extended cut of this interview and others, head over to Broadway.com. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and you're watching The Broadway Show. And that's going to do it. Until next time, I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show.